In the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the Bush administration and the Department of Justice devised an extensive counterintelligence program to be carried out by the CIA. The plan included several coded, misleading, and euphemistic terms such as enhanced interrogation techniques, increased pressure phase, and persistent conditioning. However, the actions all shared one common denominator – torture. A bounty of recently released declassified documents, including a 535-page study conducted by the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Intelligence (SSCI), has revealed a startling account of how the CIA executed a largely ineffective campaign intended to gather information from suspected terrorists. Additionally, Mark P. Denbo, the lawyer of Guantanamo Bay detendee Abu Zubaydah, recently published a highly graphic report that details the abuses that his clients suffered in a black site secret prison. Following their brutal capture and rendition, here's what lay in store for the average terror suspect, regardless of their innocence and without, in fact, any kind of trial whatsoever. Number 10. Sleep Deprivation The CIA's stated purpose for sleep deprivation aims to reduce the individual's ability to think on his feet and, through the discomfort associated with lack of sleep, to motivate him to cooperate. The practice varied from seven days of continued wakefulness to intermittent sleep deprivation lasting up to three months. Throughout 2003, prisoners were subjected to the Frequent Flyer program in which they were moved to different cells every few hours to disrupt sleep patterns and hinder the ability to resist interrogation. Various tactics involved the use of cold water, bright flashing lights, and starvation. Sleep deprivation would also combine with other interrogation techniques, such as loud music. Number 9. Loud Music Compared to the more physical torture techniques used in the government's torture program, loud music, not to exceed 79 decibels, would seem relatively benign. However, Sergeant Mark Hadsall, a member of the U.S. Psychological Operations Team, described a far more sinister side to the tactic. If you play for 24 hours, your brain and body functions start to slide, your train of thought slows down, and your will is broken. That's when we come in and talk to them. Detainees were forced to listen to an assortment of songs continuously for several days that included The Real Slim Shady by Eminem, Saturday Night Fever by The Bee Gees, and We Are The Champions by Queen. But the selection also featured blaring, non-stop tracks such as Barney's I Love You and the Meow Mix theme, with the sole purpose of creating madness. Furthermore, to show contempt for Muslim culture and faith, guards would play Arab music during the first day of Ramadan, a blatant disregard of Islamic law. Number 8. Cramped Confinement The CIA frequently placed detainees in dark and confined spaces for lengthy periods of time. The confined body would experience excruciating pain from muscle contractions as well as desensitization from being isolated in the dark. Zubonar later described his time in the dog box. As soon as they locked me up inside the box, I tried my best to sit up, but in vain, for the box was too short. I tried to take a curled position, but to no vain, for it was too tight. Another layer of psychological torture would later be added by putting insects inside the box. Although only harmless insects were used, the victim wouldn't have the ability to discern what had been dropped until he was released. Number 7. Waterboarding Much has been written and discussed in the media about the controversial use of waterboarding. According to Malcolm Nance, a former U.S. Navy chief petty officer and counterterrorism expert, the assertion that being waterboarded is not torture is just simply a lie. Waterboarding is not a simulation. Unless you have been strapped down to the board, have endured the agonizing feeling of the water overpowering your gag reflex, and then feel your throat open and allow pint after pint of water to involuntarily fill your lungs, you will not know the meaning of the word. In short, waterboarding is a controlled drowning. The detainee's face is covered with a towel and strapped to a board. He is then lowered on an angle so that his head is closer to the ground than the rest of his body. The steepness of the angle directly correlates to the severity of the exercise. Water is then slowly poured around the nose and mouth, making breathing more difficult, and it causes perception of suffocation and incident panic. Waterboarding, among other techniques on this list, was practiced on American servicemen as part of the U.S. military's controversial SERE, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, Escape program. Ostensibly, this was to harden them up to enemy capture, but there's a lack of evidence that America's enemies ever subjected prisoners to waterboarding. Hence, some think the only thing this program's torture component was designed to harden soldiers to was the act of torturing others. Number 6. Facial Hold The facial hold calls for an interrogator to put at least one hand, usually both, firmly on both sides of a detainee's face from behind to immobilize the head. 
This technique creates an environment designed to correct the detainee in a way that demonstrates the interrogator's control. Unhampered by any procedural limits, the enforcer had free reign to apply unlimited pressure to squeeze the detainee's head. Similar to other methods, the facial hold is often employed as a supplemental technique and combined with other torture methods to intensify the torture. Number 5. Walling The CIA defined walling as firmly pushing individuals into a fake, flexible wall so the shoulder blades make contact while the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel. The idea was purportedly to intimidate more than to hurt. However, the SSCI was more accurate in its own description of the practice as slamming detainees against a wall. Official CIA guidelines were basically non-existent, which meant the amount of force used and the number of repetitions was entirely up to interrogators. Zabida recounts how detainees were dragged naked and hooded in chains and then slammed headfirst into concrete walls. The fake, flexible plywood walls were not routinely used, and when they were, their sole purpose seemed to be to minimize evidence of abuse. There was seemingly no regard for the rule of law, let alone for human compassion. In fact, the interrogators subjected two detainees with broken feet to walling despite CIA cables telling them not to. There also seems to have been little regard for the quality of the information obtained. Given the high potential for brain injury, confessions can't have been that reliable. Number 4. Sexual Abuse This one was strictly off the books. Sexual abuse as an interrogation technique wasn't described in any official memo, let alone guidelines, so torturers could do what they wished. Sexual molestation, coerced performance of sexual acts, electric shocks to the genitals, and rape were all employed to humiliate the victim. And the CIA did all of this with religion in mind. Subverting taboos to cause emotional distress, female personnel would, for example, take their shirts off during interrogations or give forced lap dances to men. At least one woman wiped menstrual blood, really just red ink, onto a male detainee's body. In addition, female detainees were raped in front of men. In light of these revelations, the sexual abuse of prisoners at Abu Ghraib seems far less anomalous. In fact, it's apparently so rife that many people in nations occupied by the US believe rape is the standard treatment in US detention centers. Number 3. Threats Far from seeking to rehabilitate this negative perception of the US military, interrogators used it to their advantage. It made their threats more credible. Interrogators could threaten to rape and kill a detainee's mother or family, knowing that they would probably believe it. Threats on detainees' own lives were also issued. To lend credibility to these, mock executions were sometimes staged. On one occasion, guards started yelling outside an interrogation room before firing a handgun. Then, when the detainee was led out of his room, they passed by one of the guards, hooded and dressed as a detainee, lying motionless on the ground. While these threats weren't officially approved for use, interrogators were apparently advised that conditional threats were okay. In other words, they couldn't say, we'll rape and murder your children, but they could say, we'll rape and murder your children, if such and such. Number 2. Drugs The CIA has a terrifying history of weaponizing mind-altering drugs. And one type, in particular, quinolone antibiotics, is apparently still used for torture. Mefloquine, an antimalarial, is associated with severe neuropsychological effects, including paranoia, aggression, hallucinations, ataxia, convulsions, and suicidal ideation. It can also lead to permanent brain damage, long-term seizures, and notably memory impairment. These symptoms affect a massive 25% of patients. Needless to say, it's not the first drug you would choose if you wanted reliable intel. Yet every single Guantanamo detainee upon arrival was given 1,250 milligrams, five times the recommended dose, with the intention of inducing these symptoms. Number 1. Rectal Rehydration The nutrient enema, i.e. feeding by the backside, is rare in medicine nowadays. Dating back to the Middle Ages, it went out of fashion well over a century ago. IV infusions are both safer and more effective, avoiding the potential for damage, inflammation, prolapse, and food rotting in the digestive tract. The colon isn't capable of breaking down whole meals worth of fats and proteins anyway. Still, the CIA described rectal rehydration or rectal feeding as a well-acknowledged medical treatment, you know, like leeches and lobotomies. It didn't matter that few of those they subjected to it had anything resembling a medical need. That was besides the point. According to the chief of interrogations, the idea was to gain total control over the detainee. One detainee's lunch tray of hummus, pasta with sauce, nuts and raisins was liquefied and administered rectally. According to the description of those involved, you get a tube up as far as you can and the flow will self-regulate, sloshing up the large intestines. Meanwhile, detainees were forced to wear diapers for extended periods, hours or even days, so they overflowed and dried on their bodies. So I'm not going to ask whether you enjoyed that video, but if you found it interesting and informative, please do 
click that like button below. Also, do subscribe to this channel. We've got brand new videos every day. If you'd like to, hit that notification bell so you find out when they actually come out. And thank you for watching.